this sun and see the God who cannot be seen. We look at this sun and see God's original purpose in everything created. For everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, rank after rank after rank of angels, everything got started in him and everything finds its purpose in him. He was there before any of it came into existence and holds it all together right up to this moment. And when it comes to the church, he organizes and holds it together like a head does a body. He was supreme in the beginning and leading the resurrection parade. He is supreme in the end. From beginning to end, he's there towering far above everything and everyone so spacious is he so roomy that everything of god finds its proper place in him without crowding not only that but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe people and things animals and atoms get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies all because of his death, his blood that poured down oh, from the cross. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. Sing, Jesus won it all. Jesus won it all. You are greater.
your presence in this place, Jesus. We'll sing. Sing, Jesus. Jesus, on it all, you are greater, greater than.
presence of God. And I love when we're in church and we're worshiping him and we're honoring him and we're lifting up the name of Jesus. And the Bible says that if two or three are gathered together, there he is in the midst of them. And he's here this morning. And I really believe that even in a crowd like this today, that there's probably people out there that have some challenges going on in your life. Maybe you have some needs. I don't know what it is, but what I want to tell you is that God does. And there's nothing that happens in our life that ever takes God by surprise. He's always fully aware what's going on in us because he loves us. As a father loves his kids, so does our father love us, his children. And I want to encourage you today and I want to invite you today that if you have a struggle going on in your life, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's financial, maybe it's physical, maybe it's a relationship thing, maybe it's an emotional thing. I don't know, but I don't have to know because God knows. And I want to invite our prayer partners to come forward this morning. And what I want to encourage you to do is that you are not meant to do life alone. We are meant to do life with each other. And so times like this, when there's struggles in our lives, don't try and fix it on your own. Don't try and do it on your own. Come together. Let's agree together. Let's get someone to pray with you and agree on that thing. Because the Bible says there's power in agreement. So this morning, as we just continue to worship and I'm going to pray over us, I want to invite you right now to come forward. It doesn't matter what it is. There's nothing that's too insignificant for God. And there's nothing that's too big for God. And he wants to meet you this morning right where you're at. So as we pray, we just would love for you to come and be with our prayer partners today so that we just want to see miracles and greater things happen in your life. Father, we love you. We thank you for your presence today, God. We thank that you, that you are here to do something great in the lives of your people. And Jesus, I pray for every person this morning that comes forward that has a need represented in their life. Lord Jesus, I know that you are the miracle worker, that you are the one who answers our prayers. And God, we just believe together that every prayer will be answered, Father. Because at the end of the day, Jesus, you are the one. You are the reason why we are here. And you, Jesus, are the center of it all. And we give you all the glory and we give you all the praise. And we love you today. Come on forward and we would love to pray with you this morning as we sing. Jesus at the center of it all. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be. It's always been you, Jesus. Jesus. Sing Jesus. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be. It's always been you, Jesus. Jesus, nothing else matters. Nothing in this world will do. Come on, lift it up. We love you today, Jesus. Jesus, you're the same. 
every tongue shall confess you, Jesus. Jesus. Sing it again, Jesus be. Jesus be the center of our church. Jesus be the center of our church. And every knee will bow, and every tongue shall confess you, Jesus. You, Jesus, we shall. Bless you.
gesture, a high five, let them know you're glad they're in the house of the Lord this morning, and we'll let you be seated. While they're doing that, we want to say welcome to all of you watching us on live stream today. It's an honor to have you in the house of the Lord with us, joining us wherever you might be this morning. Amen. It's good to be in the house today, and we are glad during this first service you got up early, even in the summer, to come to church, and we're glad to have you here this morning, and as our ushers prepare to receive our morning uh, tithes and offerings, and as you prepare uh, your gifts, there's envelopes there in the seat pocket um, if you need an envelope, um, but we just want to say as they're preparing, welcome to our guests. You may have noticed when you walked in this morning that there is a piece of red carpet that's rolled out there from our guest services out to the parking lot. And we like to say that um, we roll the red carpet out for our guests. And we've created a little piece of red carpet that's right here that we uh, prepared. And there's all kinds of great things in here, including a DVD that tells you all about the ministries and all the opportunities, the small groups that you can be involved with here at East Valley, as well as just a bunch of free things. We want to bless you with a coffee over at our um, media cafe next door um, as soon as service is over. And we're just honored and blessed to have you in the house with us today. So if this is your first time here at East Valley, or if maybe you haven't been around for a while and you've been hearing about all the great things going on and what God has been doing here in the house, we would like to uh, get a little piece of red carpet into your hand. So if that's you, would you just lift your hand and our ushers are coming down the aisles and they'll get you a little piece of red carpet right into your hand. God bless you. Thank you for being here with us right back here in the back. Don't be shy. We're glad to have you here in the house with us today. What an honor and what a blessing. Well, we're going to receive our morning tithes and offerings. And um, here at East Valley, we felt like the Lord told us last year to, to do it a little bit differently because we really have a heart that we want to give our gifts to the Lord, not take them from you. And so we put buckets up here in the front, and our team's going to lead us in. Are we going to do greater again, or what song are we doing next? 
Oh, you know I love that song. Do you like the new song, Greater? Can we do that song? Let's do Greater again, and then you guys come on down, and let's bring, everybody stand, and let's bring our tithes. Let's worship the Lord as we bring our gifts to Jesus this morning and drop them in these buckets, because greater things are happening as we come into His presence. Amen? Let's worship the Lord as we bring our gifts. Put your hands together. And whoa. Sing whoa. Sing You are team. They work so hard to lead us in worship every single week. And uh, I know for a fact they were here for hours yesterday just practicing and um, getting ready for you and to lead you into the presence of the Lord this morning. And I especially want to say a very big um, just welcome to uh, some friends of ours. You guys remember Jerry Nicholson. Um, And Jerry and her husband Scott right down here in the front row are here visiting with us. And, um, and their son, Chase, is here with us today. And uh, um, Pastor Don, you can plug your ears for a second. Um, Chase has been accepted into USC, and they're driving him down um, to get him all uh, registered for, or not registered, but checked in for school and everything as he starts school. We're really proud of you, Chase, and we've been praying for you, and we're just excited about this next step in your life, and we're so proud of you guys and happy to have you in the house with us today, um, Scott and Jerry and Chase, and it's just an honor to have you here. And on their way back from taking Chase this week, next Sunday, they're going to be leading worship for us again. So we are get to have them next week, so we'll bring all your friends and enjoy it. It's going to be really good. Well, God bless you. We'll let you be seated. And I'm going to um, just tell you that we have some amazing things that God is doing. We just, um, uh, we're, Pastor Don and I and our ELN students were just at a conference up north at Champion Center, and um, it was just an amazing uh, time at Teen Church Conference this year. And um, by the way, I pre-registered for 50 registrations for next year um, because we like it so much, and we believe it's su- it's just such a great leadership and um, ministry conference that um, we want to take uh, 50 people. So I think we get 25 youth and 25 adult spots. So. Be thinking about that if you want to go with Pastor Don and I next year to the Team Church Conference up in um, Washington. We'd love to encourage you just to let us know and we'll get you signed up. And um, 
it's just going to be an exciting thing. But God began to speak to us about a lot of things over this last year. And we were there last week. We were at our um, pastors away with our entire staff. And um, man, God is ready to just do some amazing. He's doing amazing things, but it's just even going to the next level. We're really excited about that. And one of the areas that we want to talk to you about today and, and, and tell you is that our children's ministry. God has been putting in our heart that we need to just go to a whole nother level in our kids' program and our children's ministry. So we've been praying about that. We've been asking the Lord about it. And um, we know that one of the things that's important is that because our kids, how many of you have kids in our children's ministry? Raise your hand. Many of you do, our grandkids or relatives, uh, uh, you know, your aunts or uncles, a lot of you. And we believe that your kids are not the church of tomorrow. They're the church of today. Amen? Do you believe that, church? And so we have gone on the search all across the nation looking for the best children's pastor in the nation that we could bring in. And we believe that we found her, and we want to introduce her to you today. And I want you to give a big welcome to Esther Boley as she comes to the stage. And, and uh, we are so excited because uh, we, are, we are committed, church, to raising up young champions and, and training people how to do ministry. But we believe that um, Esther is going to come. She's coming to us with, she's very old. She's very old. She's like the same age as Pastor Don. And, um, and she brings lots of experience. Yeah, we're in the 60s, baby. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. So uh, Esther and I have been friends for over a decade. Yeah, and, um, yeah 10 years. We both work with a company called Group Publishing that does trainings and um, equipping for churches um, all across the nation, especially with children's ministry. And um, I, when we talked to Esther, she is so um, just anointed of the Lord. She told Pastor Don and I, 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 my calling is not to be a senior pastor. It's not to be anything. My calling is to kids. I've devoted my life to kids. And we got to go up and see her church, and you wouldn't believe the ministry that she does with kids. Kids are in, in the Bible. They're learning the Bible. It's, it's discipleship way down deep. But you also bring such an amazing time of just fun and bounce houses and things where the kids can come. And and have a good time, but then they learn the word. And so I just want to introduce you to Esther. Esther, will you just greet the congregation and tell Hi, them everybody. what's in your heart? And... <laughs> Hello, everybody. And yes, Joe and I, I, I just, we have had this fun relationship just working with group where everybody is like us. Um, and so we just have fun going and teaching other people and other churches and training up leaders. That's one of my great passions to train up leaders and involved in parents' lives. But I do focus on the kids a lot because I really like kids. And they're just so responsive. Like, you guys are kind of scary, I have to say. Because <laughs> you, even though you guys are responsive, kids just are naturally, that's why I love it so much. Why would anybody do anything else? Like, kids are the best. I mean, I am so excited. It's the best job in the house, people. And so I got the job. And I'm super excited to come here. I come from Jamaica originally. I'm a missionary's kid. So I lived there till I was 12, and so I bring that with me to that culture, and I'm really a Jamaican at heart. That's my heart, and I just love missions and encouraging families to go on mission trips because I was a missionary kid, and I'm all about sending people, and the Bible says go into all the world. So let's do it. Let's make it happen. Amen. So I'm excited to come. I can't look forward to come. I'm looking forward to saying goodbye there too because I love those people. And I've been there almost 10 years. That's a long time. So all through my 40s. So I've been there from 41, and I'm 51. And I'm proud to be 51, people. I love it. <laughs> You'll be there soon. Yeah. It's going to be good. I'm, so I'm, looking I'm forward still to in this. my 40s, but that's okay. <laughs> so. You're going to own it. It's going to be good. You're going to say it with that's passion. That's right. So will you do me a favor yeah. and w go down yep. here, and we're okay. just going to say a prayer over Esther. And if you have kids that are in our children's ministry, uh, would you just get up out of your seat and come on down here and get around Esther right now? Maybe just a few of you parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, let's get around Esther. And we're just going to say a prayer over her and just pray a prayer of anointing. Come on, church. You guys know what to do. Get up and get down here. Come on. This is a gift that God's given East Valley Church. We're going to treat her like that. 
So Heavenly Father, we just come before you now and we thank you, God. We praise you, Lord, for your gifts. You give good gifts to your church. And Lord, I believe you give the best gifts to your children, God. And Lord, I pray right now in the name of Jesus and our church just rallies around Esther. We rally behind our kids club, God. And we just pray that your anointing would fall on this ministry, God, that kids would dive into the Bible, that they would know the Word, God, that, that they would have a good time, they would make friends and build great relationships, and most of all, God, that they would build an amazing relationship with you. We thank you for that, God. We pray for Esther, and we pray for Scott, God, and we ask that your anointing would be all over them from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet. Lord, we thank you for them, God. We receive them as a gift from you, Lord. We believe it is your time and your call Lord, to bring them to us. We thank you for it, God. We praise you for it. And we are believing you for amazing and greater things to be happening in the lives of our kids starting today in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 God bless you. We'll let you be, go back to your seats and be seated. And um, we have been in a series this summer called uh, The Great Adventure. And so we just want to uh, continue in with that, with that series and what God is doing. We focus first on relationships, salvation, and we've been talking to you about the Holy Spirit and, and our guide, and, um, and now we're talking to you about just the destiny that's on you and on our life. We're excited. Pastor Don has done an amazing job teaching us this summer about the great adventure. We have a, I hope you know how blessed we are to have a pastor like Pastor Don. And I want you to put your hands together and give it up for Pastor Don as he brings the word to us today. Amen. Our best days are in front of us. They absolutely are. I don't care if you're pushing 50 so hard it's screaming, or whether you're just getting started in life, our best days are ahead of us. And I'm not saying that just as a pep talk. I'm saying that because I believe it way in the core of my being because of who he is, because who God is and what he's got planned for us. The Bible says we can't even think or imagine what it is that God has stored up for us. And, and yet he tells us to use our God-given imaginations correctly. You've all got one. You've all got a great imagination in there. And yet, so many of us have uh, unintentionally learned to dwell on all the things that might go wrong. All the things that just might uh, quench our dreams and keep us from accomplishing the things that we really want to accomplish. But we can learn something from the little guys in this. Esther will show you as she builds an amazing ministry, the kind of ministry that we've dreamt about for years and years here for our kids. She'll show you what can happen because when you ask a little guy what he wants to be when he grows up, you never hear, um, you know, I want to I work in an insignificant position in a company and I get an 18th cubicle from the right and I don't want to be known for anything. You'll never hear a little guy say that. They have big dreams and big hopes, and I don't believe that's naive. I believe that's God-given. I think that's a little bit of what God was coming for when Jesus said, be like these guys. Be like these guys. Learn to trust me for big things in your life. And, and I want you to know that no matter where you are in your life, no matter what station you are in your life, God is wanting to rekindle that in you, wanting to get you dreaming again, wanting to get you thinking bigger than you're currently thinking because he doesn't want you down there in the flatlands of mediocrity. That place out there where you've just caved in, you've just kind of given up and said, well, this isn't as much as I wanted, but, you know, it, it'll do. It, it, it's better than it could be, I suppose. No, no, no. God doesn't want you thinking that way. He's destined you to think very differently. And the good news is he doesn't want you to go that alone. He doesn't want you to attempt to do life by yourself. Because up here, up here in the, in the highest altitudes, you matter. And you are important to what God is doing because up here, God has roped you together with a bunch of other people who want to go higher, who want to go to the next level. Nobody attempts to scale the heights by themselves. That's the height of foolishness. It's, it's, just, it's just so unwise. And the reason for that is because the margins up here are razor thin. The margin for error is very small, and so you can't afford to be up here all by yourself because right on the edge of that ridge that you see these climbers on, that's a 7,000-foot drop-off, sheer cliff. You can't veer just a little bit, and if you do, you need others that are with you to pull you back and say, hey, you're getting a little off track. Don't go over there because over there is, is absolute death, and you'll never get to the top straying off the path. 
We've said that we need to choose our guide carefully as we attempt to, to leave those, those flatlands behind, as we attempt to go to the next level. It takes way more than just desire and way more than even skill. It takes a commitment to what God is doing in our lives. When we choose the Holy Spirit as our guide to scale these heights, we're choosing the guide who not only knows this mountain real well, he made this mountain. He knows absolutely everything about it, and he will get us to the top. But as we choose to follow his leadership, then he chooses our climbing partners. He chooses who we should climb with, for how long, and up which peaks. He, he brings us together, a varied people, a, a people of completely different backgrounds and skill levels and experience levels, and he mixes us all together as only he can to make us an amazing force for him. And then he chooses the climbing order that we'll climb in. And we said last week that if he chooses you for out there in the lead position, you have some things to do that, that are different than the other positions in the climbing order. Out there you have to serve as a windbreak. The winds can be 100 miles an hour up here on the peaks. And you have to take the full brunt of that when you're out in front. And nobody can do that forever. And so he alters that climbing order a lot. Because you can only be breaking the trail for so long before somebody has to kind of take their turn there as well. If you're here in the, in the very back, you, you may think, well, I, I, I'm in the back. I don't matter much. It's not that big a deal that I'm here. But you matter so much because you're the last line of defense. You're the one that can see best how the rest of the climbers are doing. You can see who's faltering, who's struggling, maybe who's veering a little off path. And you can be the one to kind of blow the whistle and say, whoa. Well, we need a halt for just a minute. We've got to help our one here that's stumbling just a bit. So you have a real critical place no matter where you are, no matter how insignificant you think your role is. You are majorly important. Pastor Joe talks about an impression that you, Scott, made on him, and you didn't even know him. But, but he was up there at, at your church in Washington State and pouring down rain. And uh, you had that, that lead position in the parking lot ushers out there, the first one everybody sees. He said, I could not believe the enthusiasm of this man. This man was so into it, and he was so welcoming. So let me help you out as the rain's just pouring all over you. Instead of going, I can't believe I got stuck with this out here, you understood how critical your role was. Because the very first impression that that church was going to make on people was you. Way before Pastor Kevin ever got a shot at him, way before Jerry and the team ever got a chance to lead them in worship, they saw you and your team out there. And, and I'm not kidding you. I hear that story a lot. I mean, it, it was a big deal. It, it made a big impression on him. And he didn't even know who you were yet. You see, a lot of times, it's easy for you to think, well, my role isn't very important. It, it, I'm not up on a stage. I'm not seen by everybody. Nobody knows me. If I go out to Home Depot or out to the grocery, nobody notices me. God, when these guys go up there, everybody, oh, there's Jerry. Woo. But, but you matter so much. You have no idea how much you matter, and the Lord himself knows where to place you because he has not wired you to, to do this thing called life by yourself. It's interesting in a culture that is so populous as, uh, as we enjoy here in America and so prosperous, how many people have by default been through hurts and through struggles and frustrations of trying to work it out with other people have defaulted to doing life by themselves, to being alone in a crowd. Am I talking to anybody here today? That you know what that feels like to, to be, yeah, you're surrounded by all kinds of people, but you feel lonely. And there's something wrong with that because God hasn't hardwired you to be like that. You can get away with doing it alone if you just settle for a mediocre life. But you can't really settle for that because the Holy Spirit's always saying, come up here. I have more for you. I have greater for you. There's more that I want to do in your life. I didn't put you on this earth just to create carbon dioxide for the plants. I've got animals that can do that for me. I've got bigger things for you, and to do that, I need to rope you to other people. Look what Ecclesiastes says. Familiar verse here, but I want to read it to you. In verse 4, he says, two people are better off than one. Do you agree with that? Do you agree with God when he says two people are are always better off than one. See, it's not enough to read these scriptures and even be familiar with them. You've got to decide, am I going to apply that to my life? Is that going to be a guiding principle for my life? Because he says categorically. He doesn't say most of the time. He doesn't say occasionally. He says two people are always better off than one. And then he goes into all these practical reasons. The, the reason they're better off is because they can help each other succeed. 
There is nothing like a team when people begin to commit to each other and to the purposes of God in each other's lives, not only in their own. When they stop looking out for number one, when they stop uh, uh, kind of begging off on, well, I'm not my brother's keeper anyway, when they realize that's just the wrong way to think and they say, I'm going to be committed to something bigger than me, uh, a, a group that is larger, what God is wanting to do. When we begin to help each other succeed, there really is no limit to what God can do in and through us. That's what his word declares. He says, now practically, here's why. If one person falls, that's, that's, that's assuming that as we attempt these heights, these are not easy conditions up here. These are extremely challenging to the limit of human endurance. And so it's inevitable that somebody's going to stumble sometime. And he said, when that happens, the other can reach out and help. But he said, somebody who falls alone is in real trouble. And that's true up here. If you end up alone up here, no one may notice. The slopes of Everest, for instance, are just littered with dozens of people who didn't make it back. And because the conditions are so harsh, there's no way to really bring them back for a proper burial. So they just become permanently a part of the landscape up there, frozen in that position because they didn't have anybody to help them up when they fell. That's not God's will for you. God's will for you is to have people around you who can reach out and help you when you stumble. Because it'll be your turn to help them soon enough. Because we all fall. The Bible says, though a righteous person falls seven times, they shall arise if they're doing life God's way. Because the reason they'll arise is not because they're all tough and all that. Because somebody else will reach out and say, I got you. You may have disappointed me, but I still got you. You may be in a place where you're stumbling in life, but I've got you because God has roped us together. And if you go down, I go down. And you were there for me. And if you weren't, you will be. He said two people lying close together can keep each other warm. Up here, that's a big deal. If you get caught in a storm up here, the blizzard's up here with the wind raging at, at over 100 miles an hour and with blizzard conditions, you literally cannot see your hand in front of your face. Uh, you need to be tucked in with other people just to survive, let alone to thrive. So it's God's will for you to be connected to other people. So that a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated. But two can stand back to back and conquer. I just love that imagery. Back to back and conquer. He said three are even better because a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Do you see the picture that God wants for your life? If you're finding yourself at a place where you're kind of alone, where you, you're not sure who you can trust, you're not sure who's got your back, everybody likes to throw that phrase out, I got your back. But we've all had somebody say that to us and then they didn't when we really needed him. But can I tell you, don't you let that keep you from God's best for your life. Because God wants to rope you together with people who are learning how to make good on that statement, I got your back. We're back to back and we're going to fight this thing all the way to the end. No weapon that is formed against us shall prosper, the Bible says. And so you need to know this. I'm with you and I'm for you. And I know that you're with me and for me. We can take any mountain if we have that kind of arrangement in life. Well, when you go along, Remember what we said last week from the very beginning? God said it is not good that man be alone. And if you read the account of creation, it's interesting. Well, he made this. He, you know, he, he, he made light, and he said that's a good thing. And then he separated the light from the darkness. He said that's good. And he, he, he made the land uh, separate from the sea. He said that's good. And he made the, the plants for the, uh, for the food for the animals. He said that's a good thing. He made all the animals. That's good. He made man, and he looked down, and he said, whoa, that's not good because that man is alone. So it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good, and then it's not good. Pay attention when God says something's not good. And he says it's not good that you be alone. And I'm not just talking about people who, who have gone to the extreme of a hermit's life where they isolate themselves physically from everybody. Those people are very rare. But what is far too common are people that in the middle of a crowd feel completely all alone. Who, whose only re interaction with people is, has degraded down to just surfacey stuff. How about them kings? Are they going to stay or are they going to go? I mean, I know that's important life or death for some folks, but can I tell you there's a few things that actually are bigger than that. I mean, I'm going to love Chase anyway, even that he's going to become a Trojan. That's, that's just God's sense of humor. Yeah, look at over here. She's doing the whole, yeah. I love you, Nikia, just not that part. But I love, I love you. I'm committed to you. 
See, I mean, that's fun stuff, but that's, that's about all we have if we're not committed to being roped together the way God wants. Now listen, when God ropes you together, He ropes you together with some people you like, some you don't like so much. He ropes you together with people who you need in order to become all that God has called you to be. And some of those are great people, encouragers, building you up all the time. Some of them are like iron sharpening iron, and that's so sweet to quote that. Until the iron's scraping stuff off of you. And it's like, this isn't all that fun. But you don't worry about it because God will bring enough joy into your life to make those things worth it. But you need to be walking this out together. Doing life alone is not good. It's not God's plan for your life. And I want to tell you why. It's not just God beating up on you today. Because if you feel alone today, you are probably in a majority rather than a minority. So you, you feel like you're the only one going through this. But the, the wild thing is that most people feel that way from time to time in their life, sometimes all the time in their life. And here's why God says it's not good that you would be alone in life. Depression and discouragement is rampant in our culture today, and I believe it's because that's what is the byproduct of choosing to do life alone. I'll never get hurt again, so I'm not going to get close to anybody anymore. That person has tr torn me up emotionally. I'm not, I'm not letting anybody in like that ever again. When you choose to go alone, depression and discouragement become your companions, your constant companions. And you might get real good at faking the outside, having all the right phrases. Yeah, I mean, the, the trite and true, how you doing? I'm fine. People lie every day. The greatest majority of people that say they're fine when they're asked how they're doing are not even remotely close to fine. They just don't want to get into it. They don't really trust you to tell you what's going on, or the truth is they're pretty sure you don't really want to know either. You just want fine and move on. But that's not God's plan for your life. And up here it'll get you killed. See, if you're going to live the challenging life that God has for you, you've got to agree with him. And he says, your ways are not my ways, the Lord's speaking now. But as the heavens are higher than the earth beneath, so are my ways higher to be preferred over yours. It's not God trying to be superior. It's God being superior. He is better. His ways are right. And so he says, listen, no matter how much pain is caused in your life by attempting to do life together with other people, uh, keep buying into God's way of doing life as a team, doing life together, because it's the best. Because otherwise you'll end up discouraged. You'll end up isolated. And the problem with once you begin to get isolated is you, you begin to get further isolated the longer you live in that habit pattern. So that no matter how many crowds God puts you in, you feel more and more alone. And can I tell you, even the greatest among us struggle when they're isolated. The greatest, the most skilled, the most impressive people among us struggle when they're isolated because they're not wired. It'd be like you trying to breathe underwater. You're just not made to do that. And you can't. And if you try, you might say, no, but I can hold my breath longer than anybody else in the room. Good for you. But there will be a point where you're out of air. And if you don't come up for air, you're not made to breathe underwater. Just like a fish isn't made to breathe out here. God didn't make you to do life alone. You were made to be part of a team. You want a great example of this is a man named Elijah in the Bible. One of the greatest men that probably ever lived. This is a guy who, who saw God do incredible things through his life. I mean, this guy saw bona fide mind-blowing miracles in his life fairly regularly. This is a guy who really achieved a lot in his life, so much so that thousands of years after he's living, we're still talking about him. Aren't you hoping they'll kind of talk about you maybe a week or two after you're gone? I mean, you, you hope you made some kind of impression that outlasts you, but this is a guy who lived such a remarkable life, such a successful life, such an incredible encounter with God that we're still talking about him all these years later. And yet this is a man who struggled mightily with isolation, who found himself feeling alone a lot of the time. And he got to the point where he felt so alone, he actually got suicidal in the midst of some of his greatest successes. Instead of being able to really enjoy those successes, he found himself more and more isolated, more and more discouraged to the point of God, just, just, just take me now because I'm all done. And I want to show you what I believe is a revealing window into his soul. At the, the start of a Bible account of this very famous confrontation he had with the prophets of Baal, he said, listen, you guys, you've got to figure out who's God and who isn't. 
So let's take all the guys of Baal, and we'll have a big old contest. And I'll just stand over here, and I'll represent God, and all you guys represent Baal. And let's find out who's really worthy of our trust. Let's find out who can really uh, guide our lives, and who's worthy to be our guide up here at these high altitudes. So he sets up this whole great big challenge, very public, way out there. If he's wrong, he's going to look really stupid and probably get himself killed. If he's right, people's faith hopefully will go way up in God's ability to be trusted. But I want you to look right at the start of that contest before this victory happens, a statement that Elijah makes that shows you what's going on inside of him and why he's finding himself so discouraged. It's found in 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 21, Elijah went before the people and he said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left. But Baal has 450 prophets right here. Now, wait a minute. He's in the middle of a big crowd of people. He's gathered everybody around. If this were today, he'd have been on all of the news channels. He would have been the leading story, this amazing thing, you know, developing an incident here. And he's in the middle of a lot of people. He's not playing the hermit now. And yet he feels this alone because he says, it's my conviction that I'm the only one left who will serve God like I'm wanting to serve him. He believed that way down in his core. I don't want you to miss that because it's easy to gloss over it as you're reading the account and get onto the good stuff of all this amazing big contest that's about to take place. But because he entered in this big challenge in his life uh, with a wrong perception, a great man, uh, a man who lived a life we would all like to live, a highly influential man, but because he lived uh, with this wrong perception, it took all the joy out of it for him. It took all the satisfaction out of it for him. And instead of being able to celebrate, he found himself feeling more and more isolated. Now, if you read the account, which we won't do today, but if you read it, it's a giant victory. This is about as good as it gets for one guy in front of everybody. He wins and wins big. I mean, it's extraordinary what God does. God does literally miracles right in front of the eyes of the nation. And so it should have been the, the most, you know, faith building for himself. Like, this is so cool! God is really that real. But instead of that, we find himself really discouraged and being driven by motivators that God never intended to drive him. Take a look in 1 Kings 19. Now, this is after the big victory. And Ahab, who was the king, and Jezebel, who was his wife, said uh, uh, that, that he told his wife everything that Elijah had done and how he'd killed all the prophets of the sword because this was a fight to the death. When Elijah won, these guys lost and... They were taken out. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah and said, May the gods be, deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. This is a very real danger that Elijah finds in men. It's hard for us to imagine, but these guys, in the time that they lived, to be a king was to be an absolute despot. You, you could absolutely do basically whatever you wanted. You had absolute authority. And so when the queen says, I'm going to kill you, you better believe she has the authority and the power and the will to carry that out. And this is a very bad person here. <laughs> so Elijah is under a real danger. Don't, don't misunderstand that. Notice his response. It's, it's typical. It's what our response will be. Elijah was afraid, and he ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah... He left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. Now listen, he's afraid. We understand that. He has every reason to be aware that, man, I'm under real danger. But his response to the danger he's in is to run and isolate himself with his servant. But then even that isn't isolated enough. He tells the servant, you stay here and I'm going to go further away. Do you see what fear does to you? It drives you further away, even from the people you know are there for you for all of your life. You still find yourself isolating even from them. That's what he did. So he goes a day's journey out further, all by himself into the desert. He comes to a broom tree there. He sat down under it, and he prayed to, that he might die. He said, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Now listen, this is right on the heels of the greatest victory of his life. This, this is the most validating moment of his life. God showed up and said, I'm with you, Elijah, and I'll prove it to everybody. I'm for you. 
I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm with you, Elijah. And yet, instead of being able to completely enjoy that, he finds himself facing another challenge, and fear begins to be his motivator rather than faith. Now, this is the man of great faith. Probably uh, puts us all a little bit to shame here in the amount of faith that he had in God. To be able to go out, if we could have read that whole story of how out there he was with his faith. God is God and Baal is not, and we're going to prove that. And he's way out on the limb. If he's wrong about that, he's going to look really dumb and lose his life. But instead, he's way out there. So he's a man of great faith. But here when he faces this danger, because he's isolated, he's not able to move based on his faith. He's moving based on fear. And that gets him to a place of isolation and great discouragement. And if that happens to great people of faith, what's going to happen to us? If we find ourselves maybe maybe not identifying with Elijah as that great a person of faith, and yet when we let fear be our motivator, we're going to find ourselves isolated and discouraged. And there's a reason for that. It's not just that we're bad people. God said, I didn't make you to live that way. And here it's further complicated by the enemy of your soul who's coming after you to destroy you. He cannot stand you because of who you belong to. And so he's coming with one purpose in mind, and that is to destroy you. And the Bible says, let me tell you how he attacks you so you're not getting blindsided. You ever been hit when you didn't see it coming? Been in a car or something and just totally didn't see that coming? Or or maybe you played sports and and you got... Listen, the hits that you see coming, you can kind of brace for and be ready, but it's the ones you don't see coming. Many of you know what that is relationally. You've had a relationship blow up that you did not know was even in trouble. And when it happened, it was so blindsided. God says, I don't want you to get blindsided by the way things come after you, so let me tell you what goes on. It's found in 1 Peter 5 and 7. And he says, listen, give all your worries to God Give your cares to him because he cares for you. He says, stay alert and watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, if you you turn on Discovery Channel or one of those nature channels and you see a special that that is is being presented on the, the hunting methods of lions, you'll see one thing that they all have in common. They largely prey on animals that are designed by God to be in a herd, to be in with a group. The sheer numbers keeps them protected because it's confusing which one is lunch. All those zebras all together, it's hard to pick one individual out. But what lions will do is they'll get the herd spooked, and they'll get them running. And then as they run, they'll say, who's weak? Who twisted their ankle in that in that?" Go for a hole there. Who, who's, who's too young to keep up? Uh, who's too old and too worn out? They watch for that one that's not keeping up, and then they let all the rest of them go, and they cut that one out from the rest of the herd, and then they run that animal down. They hit them when they're at their lowest point, when they're at their weakest point. They isolate, and then they close in for the kill. And God is saying in his word, that's the way the enemy of your soul is hunting you. You cannot afford to be isolated. You cannot afford because you may outrun them for a time, but when you reach that weak moment, that hurt moment when somebody has hurt you and you're discouraged and you're down and you're kind of out of energy and you're kind of out of the the best of yourself on your worst day, when you're isolated, it's only a matter of time and God is saying, don't let that happen to you. Don't let that happen to you. Don't ever get split out from the herd. Any thought of isolation, any, any, uh, you know what, I'm just not going to let anybody get close to me anymore. When you start thinking that way, it's understandable, but it's not a, a good strategy for you. Because this is the way your enemy is hunting you. He says, instead, stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Don't let fear motivate you. Let faith motivate you. That's very important. It says, remember that your Christian brothers and sisters all over the world are going through the same kind of suffering you are. In other words, the whole herd's being chased down. But you know what? If we stay together, if we fight for each other, I've seen a few specials like this when, when some prey animal just says, I've had it. And it just kind of turns around and the rest of the herd turns around and says, all right, I do have horns. I do have hoofs. And you're going down. And when they all decide to, to act like predators instead of prey. It's amazing. That little lion's going, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. 
what I had going for me has been taken away. I, I scare them with my roar. I, 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 I isolate them, and yet they're not isolating. They're, they're ganging up on me, and now I'm the one that's weaker. Now I'm the one that's not able to stand against them when the, when the body finally starts being aggressive to go after hell instead of running from hell. The gates of hell cannot... Uh, prevail against us. People quote that all the time like gates are chasing you. Gates don't chase anything. They're there to, to hold you out and say when you finally quit isolating and when you pull together and everybody goes together in the same way and you go after that enemy, he, he becomes defenseless. God has given you the skill set to be a great person of faith. But even a man like Elijah, who had great faith, slipped over to let fear be his motivator. But here's the thing. Fear and faith both require the same thing of you. Fear and faith both require you to believe in the things that have not yet happened as if they had already occurred. Think about it. Have you ever been afraid of something that never really happened? Wouldn't you say that most of the things you were afraid of never did come to pass? You say, yeah, but that one thing did, and, and that was bad. Well, okay, but, but how much stress and how much worry did you put yourself through when you worried about things that never happened anyway? That's a God-given uh, gift being misused in your life. God gave you a great imagination because he knew you'd need it for faith. See, Hebrews 11 and 1 says faith means being sure of the things that we hope for and knowing that something is real, even if we don't see it. See, faith has to have the ability to imagine a different future, to imagine things better than they are today, to imagine that we're not flatlanders by design, but we're supposed to scale the heights, to imagine that I could be in, in an exhilarating lifestyle where roped together with other people who are equally committed, we can achieve amazing things for God, to begin to dream about those things together and to encourage each other to build those up and to say together we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us together. Nothing is impossible to us because we believe in Christ Jesus and we're committed to his purpose. He is our our guide and we're going exactly where he tells us to go together he's going to take us over one mountain peak after another conquering one enemy after another because we're in this together you see you're created to think like that and when you do you begin to be filled with strength and joy but when you let fear drive you when you let fear be your motivator isolation and discouragement become your companions so can I tell you when you're at the end of your rope Remember, you're never alone. When you're all the way at the end here, it feels like there's nobody on the other end. There's 150 feet of rope there. Sometimes it's slack. But God has made sure that you are roped together with other people, always. He has said to you, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And I'm going to give you people who won't leave you either. I'm going to put you around people who understand that they're called to each other, that they're called to do this together. I'm going to put you around people who I will give you favor with. I'll put you in their hearts. They'll want to be tied to you because I'm going to do that for you. I'm going to put you in a position where you don't have to be isolated ever again. When you get to the end of your rope, remember, I'm roped together with other people. I'm roped together with God as my guide. And nothing can overwhelm me when I'm roped together. The only time it's dangerous is when I unhook. Jesus has promised to be with you always in John 14 and 16 and many other places. He says this, I'll ask the Father and he'll give you another advocate who will never leave you. The Holy Spirit will never bail on you. On your best day, he's right there. But on your worst day, he's right there. And then he gives you people who say, I would rather not be roped to you, but I know I am, and so we're in it together. You see, God has come into your life to give you a different way of doing life, not to leave you by yourself, not to isolate you, but to include you with all these other people. And when you have somebody roped together, you're, here's the cool thing. In the tough times, you have people to strengthen you and to be with you, but in the good times, you've got somebody to celebrate with. Nanette and I love to travel. We, we've traveled all over the world, and we love that. But I can't imagine traveling all by myself and going, ooh, ah, oh, look at... I'll take a picture so I can share it with somebody later. Look at that. That's great. But I, 
There's nobody here to really say, look how cool that is. You see, you're hardwired to share the victories as well as the challenges and to enjoy those, to celebrate those together. It's one of the reasons why uh, uh, the anniversary service that Pastor Joe put together and the staff put together for Nanette and I last year, that was just such a blast. It was so out of nowhere. But to sit and just kind of reflect on 10 years together and how that's been was really cool. And I hope it was for you. That's what many of you said was, you know what, it, it wasn't just all about you. It was just about celebrating what God did here together and what he's going to do as we look forward to greater things. Now, I don't want to leave Elijah hanging. I don't want to leave him in that bad place. Great man of faith, all isolated, all depressed to the point of suicide. I don't want to leave him there. I want to wrap it up so that you know what really happened for him because uh, Elijah had developed this real bad trend in his life of isolating and being alone and everything. And where we last left him, he's all by himself out there in the middle of nowhere with his servant a whole day's walk away from him. And uh, he has an encounter with God. And God's about to correct his misperception of how he should be doing life. So if you look with me back there in, in the account in chapter 19, 1 Kings. He's having this whole face-to-face -face encounter with God. God does all these things, and he's not in that, and he's not in this, he's not in that. But then God's talking to him. And Elijah hears him, and he says he covers his face with his coat. And he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And then a voice said to him, Elijah, why are you here? I believe some of you are hearing that voice right now from God. Why are you here, isolated? Why are you in this place where you feel alone? Why are you finding yourself uh, alone in a crowd? What, why are you here? He's asking that of Elijah. He's not accusing him because he's about to fix it. But he says, I want to challenge the way that you're doing life right now. And so Elijah answered him, Lord God all-powerful. So he knows who he's talking to. He's not confused here. He knows it's God talking to him. He said, I've always served you as well as I could. Anybody ever prayed that way? God, I'm doing the best I know how to do. This, this is the best I got for you. But the people of Israel have broken their agreement with you, destroyed your altars, and killed your prophets with swords. That's all true, by the way. They did all that stuff. He said, I'm the only prophet left. And now they're trying to kill me too. And he believed that in his heart. Listen, he knows he's talking to Almighty God. You don't lie to God when you know you're face to face with him. He believes that. I'm the only one left. And God knew that too. So he said, I'm about to talk to you. So he gives Elijah several things to do. And then he says this in verse 18. Hey, Elijah, let me correct your perception. I have 7,000 people in Israel who have never bowed down before Baal and whose mouths have never kissed his idols. There's 7,000 more just like you, Elijah. You just don't know him yet, but I'm about to give you someone that will help you stay connected, rope together. He said, Elijah, I know it feels like you're alone, but there are 7,000 others. When the communist regime took over in China, they made Christianity illegal to the point of death if you became a Christian, and for decades... That rule existed. And the worry all over the world was that the church maybe was stamped out in China. When China began to be a little bit more open and let people come into their country, people were astounded to find that the church had absolutely exploded. That there were hundreds of thousands of Christians all across that country that had flourished together because God spoke to them and said, you're not alone even though it feels like you're alone. There are many others like you. And they were risking their lives to band together, to get together and to say, we won't do for us to be isolated. We know how our enemy hunts us. We're going to connect together. We've got to be wise about how we do it, but we're going to do it. And they just absolutely exploded in population because they got that it's not good that man be alone. They pulled themselves together with other people. So the instruction that God gave Elijah right before this encouragement of, hey, you're not alone, even though it feels like it. He said, now, go and, and connect with Elisha because I'm giving him to you as a friend. I'm giving him to you as somebody who will never leave you, just like I'll never leave you. And I'm giving you to you as someone that's going to follow you in your ministry. Your ministry will not be wasted. So Elijah left that place, and he found Elisha, son of Saphat, and he was plowing the field with a team of oxen. He owned 12 teams of oxen, so he was a wealthy man, and he was plowing with the 12th team. 
Elijah came up to Elisha, took off his coat and put it on Elijah, and that was very symbolic. He's saying, I'm connecting myself with you. This is my coat. I'm giving it to you. We're going to do this together. That's what he was saying to Elisha, and Elisha knew that. I'm connecting with you. I, I want you with me. I want you on my team. I'm stopping my habit of isolation. I'm stopping my habit of, of doing it all by myself. And yeah, I had a servant, but I didn't even let him participate in my lowest moment, even though he'd committed his whole life to him. I want you with me. And so he gives him his coat and says, let's do this together. And let's just close it out with this. When Elijah got all the way to the last day of his life, God tells him, today's it. Today's the day. He starts to revert back to his old habit of isolating. It's the last day, and he thinks, I need to go get alone. I love the way God worked this out. Take a look at me, second, king, king second, uh, second chapter. He said, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were traveling from Gilgal. They're together. And Elijah says to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has told me to go to Bethel. Elijah, that's the old way of thinking. You're isolating yourself again. You're saying, I'm about to face a major transition time in my life. I'm going to do this all by myself. <laughs> but Elijah has been roped together properly with the right guy. Because Elisha says, as surely as the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I'll never leave you. So they went down together to Bethel. God had given him a friend who, though flawed in his own right, said, I'm never going to leave you. I'm going to follow God's pattern. I'm going to be with you no matter what we face. So Elijah realizes, okay, I'm not going to shake this guy, so we'll go over to Bethel. When they get there, the prophets tell Elisha, hey, you know that today's the day that God's unroping you from Elijah. And Elisha says, yeah, I know but I'm not leaving him. God's going to have to split us apart. And so they, <laughs> they come to, to Jericho, and Elijah does his thing again. Hey, Elisha, just stay here. Thanks, you've gone far enough. You've done enough. You've been with me far enough. Just stay here. And Elisha replies the same way. Surely as the Lord lives, I will never leave you because God has roped me with you. And so we're in this together. And they went from there, and they told him again, you know this is going to happen. And Elisha said, don't care. In other words, Elisha, this is going to hurt when God un un uncouples you. When God takes you from this leader that you've been loyal to, when God splits you apart, this is going to hurt. And he said, I know. I know what I'm up against, but the way to live life is together, and I'm going to rope myself to this guy until that's impossible. And then, when God took him up in a whirlwind, Elisha knew that his assignment had ended, but now he's to be roped with all these other young prophets that he's going to teach and he's going to grow. There's a whole transition that went on there, but he gave to Elijah a friend who would stay connected, who wouldn't unhook, who wouldn't say, you're getting to be a little hard to hang out with, so see ya. And I believe with all my heart that God wants to give you a team like that too. Listen to me carefully now. It's not good for you to be alone. It's not good. And if you're experiencing that, if you'd be honest with yourself and say, that's how it feels to me. I feel alone even in my family. I feel alone in my business. I feel alone in my community. If that's true for you, God is saying, I have a better plan for your life. I have more for you. I want to rope you together with not only me, but with many others who will be like Elisha for you, who will be roped together with you through thick or thin, no matter what you go through. And when that is true, things change. I want you to listen to a story by a friend of ours here in the church, Denise Desjardin and her husband, Brad, serve on our church council here. And this past year, Denise was uh, diagnosed with breast cancer. And uh, the treatment, of course, is chemo for her and pretty aggressive chemo. And I, I, I've just been so impressed how this couple has decided to go through this, how public they've been, and how determined they are to stay roped together with their friends, even as they go through a very difficult and what many would think is a very private battle, 
Denise and Brad have decided to include a whole bunch of us in that. And I want you to hear her story. Take a listen to what she has to say to you today. Um, it has been absolutely amazing. Uh, it has helped me so much to have so much scripture and prayer. Um, I, I can't even describe how much easier it's made it. When I first found out I had cancer, I spent quite a bit of time in prayer and I was a little overwhelmed and I really felt like I was getting from the Lord that um, it wasn't about the healing that that would come, it was about the walk and that I wasn't supposed to do it alone and I was supposed to do it quite publicly and that he would use it. And I had Ryan help me make a Facebook group to invite people to um, where I could go on and say what was going on with me and have people be able to support me there. And the next day, I got a text the next morning from Ryan and said, some secret Facebook group, Mom, there's 110 people on it already. And I was like, ah, uh, well, they're supposed to be. And they absolutely were. I mean, there are believers and non-believers on there. And there are people that are in my life and people that aren't so much in my life. But they are all supposed to be there. And they encourage me and support me. And through that, they encourage and support each other as well. And it's been phenomenal to see how God has been working through it. I think I was in the beginning when I felt like I needed to do this publicly and engage people in it. I think I was afraid that I'd have to be strong all the time or brilliant or positive or wise and to walk it out in front of people. And like that at all when I'm sick and I'm pretty sick the week after chemo and sometimes my head is pounding and I can't even begin to put two thoughts together even to pray and somebody clearly gifted intercessor posts an amazing prayer on there that completely encourages me I think that during those times that I'm feeling the worst I just wouldn't have that encouragement and I don't have to be strong all the time because I'm just part of part of the church and they have been holding me up and in turn I get to inspire other people with with their prayers as well as my testimony on the, on my support page. It's amazing how the Lord just brings puts you in places where other people that need the kind of support you're getting um, are there. I mean, in the chemo chairs, that, you know, when you have cancer, you're in a lot of places that other people have cancer. And so I have been able to um, share my experiences with them, invite them to join my support page, which they get all kinds of support as well. Um, and he's given me so much opportunity to do that and it is that has been completely like him answering promises because I really felt like he was promising me that if I would do this walk then he would use it and he is doing just that using it um, he's using it too in that a lot of people that I've invited to my support group whether there are other people I've run into that have cancer or just non-believers that are in my life, um, they are seeing they're seeing Christ there and they're meeting him there. And I'm having all kinds of people ask me questions, um, talk about the scripture. There are people that are reading scripture regularly that would never pick up a Bible. If I did this by myself, quietly, he wouldn't have that opportunity. So it's been great. People are often unreasonable and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. 
If you are honest, people may cheat you. Be honest anyway. If you find happiness, people may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today may be forgotten tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the world the best of you. It may never be enough. Give your best anyway. For you see, in the end, it is between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. Today, there's an opportunity for every one of us in this room. I really believe it. If you found yourself identifying with Elijah in this story, man, I do that. I... I don't know why, but I do that. I, I, I pull away. I, I end up being alone. Even though I think God has put people in my life to be there with me. Maybe you, you're one of those that has been so hurt by people that you've just found it easier to just go it alone. But the Lord had you here today so you could hear this. Just like he came to Elijah and said, I want to help you, Elijah. I, I want to move you away from this habit of kind of doing stuff on your own. And I want to give you perspective that you're not by yourself. And, and I want to give you people that will be with you in this. You know, Denise and Brad are people that are used to being used by God to bless others. They're generous. They've been wonderful. Many of you have had your lives touched by them. And yet when they made the decision to be in this with others, to humble themselves even to the point of letting other people fix meals for them, that has been such a blessing not only to them, but to all those who get to be a part of this with them, get to be in it with them. And the Lord wants that for you too. The Lord doesn't want you alone. You may be facing something as serious as cancer, or you may be just trying to get through your everyday life, but God has brought you to this point today so you can change the way you're approaching life so that you would never again feel alone in a crowd. And I believe if you will ask God today, He will come to you in a moment and say, I am with you and I will always be with you. And I will rope you together with a whole bunch of people because I believe this church is completely committed to being with you and doing life with you together no matter what happens. And I believe that all over this room, there are those that would say, my life looks really good on the outside, but the honest truth is this is what I'm facing. I, I feel alone even in this moment. And you want to see that change. And if you will say yes to God, He will absolutely change that for you. And I'm going to pray that that would happen for you, that you'll have courage to say yes to God today. Let's do that. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you're in this place. I thank you that time and again you've made good on your word when you said, never will I leave you and never will I forsake you, but I'll be with you always even to the end of the age. And I thank you, God, that you have called us together in this place at this time to tell us this truth, that we can't go it alone anymore. And that, God, that we're not alone. There are many of us in that place that walked into this building today feeling exactly that, isolated and alone. But you're fixing that right now in this place. And I would pray for everyone who feels that, God, that they would rise up with courage and say yes to you. Say, from this moment forward, I'm going to give myself over to Jesus Christ and allow him to connect me with other people so that I don't have to do this alone anymore. Thank you, God, for the greatest in the house and the least in the house. We all need you and each other. And I thank you that that truth will become real for many of us today as we respond to you. We're praying and God is listening because he promised he would. And if you say today, today I stop my isolation. Today I will choose Him in my life. I will give Him my life and I will connect up as He connects me with others. If that's what you're doing today, I want you to lift your head while we're praying. Look at me real bold and put your hand in the air and say, that's what I'm doing today. I'm going to stop this isolation and be connected. 
Will you just give me that indication so I can pray with you, and we're going to believe God to move everything around. I see you. See, God knows where you're at, and that takes courage, but it's the right response when God makes an offer like that to you. Well done. Well done, sis. Others that say, that's me too. That's right where I'm at, and I'm going to stop that, and I'm going to start something new with God. Just put your hand up, and I'll pray with you as well. We're going to see God do this in your life, and you will be connected like you've never been before. That's so good. That's so good. Now, Father, I thank you today that you would bring us to a place where this is true for us. And I thank you, Lord, for uh, this dear sister that's saying, I really need the Lord, and I don't want to be isolated anymore. I thank you, God, that from this moment forward, that becomes her reality, that you have connected her with other people. God, I thank you that you've done that for all of us. That maybe if, like Elijah, we've slipped a bit, even after you've made us aware that we're to do this together. God, that today you would draw us back into that place where we would trust again, where we would forgive, Lord, where we would move on together with you. I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for what you're doing in the life of each of us today. Would you rope us together even more closely, God? Let us know that we're not alone, that we're not alone, God. No matter what we feel, no matter what we go through, we are together in you. Make us a church that not only says that, but does it, God. It's people together, and we'll thank you for it with all of our heart. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now, can I tell you that for some of you, this is going to feel like swimming upstream a little bit. I want you to expect the Holy Spirit to begin to kind of point out those things that are, that are causing you to do it by yourself. To go, hey, just kind of tap you on the shoulder and say, that thought right there, I understand it, but it's not accurate. I have 7,000 more that are right alongside you. And sis, if I could just tell you, well done. That, that takes a tremendous amount of courage to say yes to God. And today, right after our service, uh, my friend Herb is going to come come say hi to you. There's some things we want to give to you so that we can kind of put some some uh, reality to the things we've said so that you would never feel like you're by yourself. So well done. I, I, I'm really impressed that you did that. Thank you for that. Can I ask everyone to stand here in this place? <clears throat> and uh, Pastor Joe is going to come and close out the service, but I, I want to encourage you also this week I feel real strongly in my spirit that God's going to connect you with people who you will recognize are getting isolated. In fact, some of you have got somebody in your heart right now thinking, I'm, I'm making a phone call this week because I think they've gotten themselves kind of out there by themselves, and I'm going to make sure that they know that, that they're not alone. And I want to urge you, obey the Lord in that. Go with that. If you just have that thought, that's not just a stray thought. That's the Holy Spirit saying, I want this to be reality for my people. He loves that friend of yours. He loves that family member. He loves that neighbor, that coworker so much that, that he's going to use you to draw them in. You just do what God tells you to do, and then we'll celebrate next week when you tell us the story. God bless you, Pastor Joe. Amen. Pastor Don, if you could just hang with us for a second. We have, and I'm going to let you be seated. We're almost done. We just have a few minutes um, of our service, and we are, today is the is um, with so many just great things that have been happening. That's why we have this song, Greater, because it's great things that are happening. But today, as we um, get ready to end our service, before we do that, we want to pray over and um, just say congratulations to some students who um, a year ago you prayed over. There are um, ELN students, Emerging Leaders Network, and they have completed their year, and this is that completion. So Lynn, if you'll come on up to the platform with me, and um, I'm going to ask uh, Leela, Jordan, and Chris to join us on the platform. <laughs> and uh, one of the things, church, that we've been called to do, and we agreed upon years ago, is that God's called us to raise up young champions. That's it's been in the DNA of, of Pastor Don and myself since the early, since 1983, 
when we started our first ELN program that was called Master's Commission at the time. And um, we've, we've had hundreds of kids that have gone through ELN and um, just given a year of their life to serving the Lord. And um, these three students have done that. Leela and Jordan, have com they're completing their second year. They did two years of ELN, serving full-time here at the church and just giving everything to Jesus for that year. And um, Chris is completing his first year. And I'm happy to say that he's entered uh, for a second year. So he's going to be with us for another whole year. We're excited about that. And Leela has been accepted to William Jessup University. So she'll be starting her freshman year of college um, at William Jessup University. And Jordan has got a bunch of options, and she's praying about what her future is going to be. But she is going to be here at the church, and she's going to be with us uh, serving and loving the Lord. And um, we're just, we are so honored, aren't we, Lynn, just to have three amazing students that God's given us. And they have been gifts. And I know that they've been gifts to you. They've prayed. They've cleaned toilets. They've done Bible studies. They've done small groups. They've helped in kids' ministry. They've done just about everything. But um, we have been blessed by your ministry and by your ministry, Leela, and by you, Chris. And we just want to say we love you. Would you guys just do us the honor of coming right down here? And we're going to end our service by praying over them and, and praying over their future and what God's called them to do. And so, Pastor Don, if you'll lead us in that prayer. And um, would you just stand and stretch your hands out towards these students as we pray. Parents and home, op home openers, those of you guys that have opened your homes, you feel free to come on up here and gather around them. Um, if you're their friend, if you're their... If you're in their life, you feel a, a little bashful to me today. Will you guys just get out yeah. of those seats? Come Don't on. Don't be afraid. Come on, Come on up. Get around these kids. It's very meaningful for them to know that we're together, especially when I preach a message like I just did that was so stellar yeah. on being roped together. Come on, you guys. Get in here. Let's rope around rope these together. guys, all right? <laughs> Sometimes easier to understand in our heads than to actually do, but here we are. Yeah. All right. Good on you. Good on you. All right. Everybody stretch your hands toward these kids, would you? Thank you, Lord. I call them kids because I'm old enough now that everybody's <laughs> kids under 50, except this guy. Thank but you, other Lord. than that, all right, guys. Father, we know that you have huge things for these people right here. We know that, God. We're not just hoping that. We know that. These are people that you've clearly you. roped together with us, and they've been extraordinary to climb the peaks yes. with God. They've been amazing in their commitment. Their love for you has been so obvious in the way that they've lived life alongside of us over these last uh, year or two, God. We thank you for their love for you. God, they, they've reminded me of why I got into this in the first place, God. They've reminded me what first love really looks like, and, and they've inspired me, and I know many others, God, yes. that this is the way that you serve the Lord. You give yes. your all. You don't hold anything back, and they have certainly done that, God, during this year, and we thank you for them. We're prophesying over them now, God, blessings from you. You said that when we went into a town and we were accepted there, that we were to leave a blessing there. And, God, that same principle applies. These young people have accepted us. They have allowed us to speak into their lives, allowed us to partner you, with them, with what it is that you're calling them to do. And so, God, we Thank bless you. them. Yes. We ask you to prosper them in every way, yes. physically, emotionally, spiritually. Open Thank doors you, for them, God. Give them great favor with people. Uh, bring, bring people in their lives that will act as butlers, who will open doors that yes. no man can shut, God. That you'll give them a great ministry, a, an extended you, ministry. Lord. Let their influence go beyond uh, this campus, God, out into the community yes. a, as they serve you. And, Father, may they be the first fruits of many. We thank you that you're bringing us students, Lord, even international students now beginning to hear about what you've done in these people's lives and want that for themselves. And so, God, knowing that they're going to come and join us and many others, Lord, the, the best of our young people rising up and saying, this is what I want. I want to give my life to the Lord and I want to follow him fully. May these be absolute first fruits of many that will follow in their footsteps. God, yes. we thank you for them and we pray that you'll bless them all the days of their life. Yes. And lastly, just this, God. Let them never wonder if they're alone. Let them know that they are roped together, God. No matter what challenges they face, what victories they celebrate, that we are with them thank all you. the days of their life. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen, amen. and amen. We love you guys. And um, our next ELN class starts the Sunday after Labor Day. And so like Pastor Don just mentioned, we have a student coming from Switzerland. Um, if you're interested in ELN, see Lynn. 
right down in the front or myself. And um, also, if you're interested in opening up your home, we need home openers for our students that are coming in. And uh, we can get you all the information on how that works. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Meet Esther down here. She'll be at the back door. Um, and just love to meet you. And we just say God bless you. And we will see you next Sunday. Love you guys. Sun that I